Hello, everybody. Welcome to part 19 of our reading of The Return of the Divine Sophia. This is our second to last. So next week is the last reading. Um, we only have two more chapters left of this book. Our next book that we're going to be covering in this series is The Woman with the Alabaster Jar, which I will put a link to that down in the description box below. All right, so let's go ahead and get started on chapter 22 of Return of the Divine Sophia. This is the power of the archetype. The passage of the mythological hero is essentially inward into the depths where obscure resistance are overcome and long lost forgotten powers are revivified to be made available for the transfiguration of the world. Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces. Nearly 25 years ago, when I drew my first goddess in Shasta Circle, I did not realize the transformative power of archetypes. Archetype was just another buzzword in psychology to me. I did not know that these prototypes for human potential not only lived inside of each of us, but also existed within the mind of the cosmos itself. The hero, the romantic, the visionary, the lover, these are not only potentials within our psyche, but aspects of the collective consciousness that dwell within the universal mind of God. As a trained hypnotherapist, healer, and clairvoyant of some 25 years, I had a good working knowledge of the many conflicting sub-personalities that live within the human psyche and knew that they are not always in accord. I always understood why psychology, in an attempt to be accepted by traditional medicine, was sought to objectify human behaviors with clinical manufactured terms such as social complex, childhood neuroses, yet long before the advent of psychology, the sages of our past knew that the universal power of archetype lies at the root of all human feeling, thought, and desire. Psychologist James Hillman, author of The Soul's Code, once wrote that modern objectification of the cosmos and of human behavior into merely clinical terms creates a kind of dreading inside of people. The language of psychology is an insult to the soul. He goes on to remind us that by working with the living powers of archetypes, we are brought back to life since these archetypes not only live within the collective consciousness of the entire human race, but within each, each of us as well. Legendary teacher Deepak Chopra adds, inside of every human being, there is an overarching theme, a template for heroic living, a god or a goddess, an embryo that yearns to be born. This is who we were meant to be, the self that we deny ourselves because most of us cannot see the film of limitless potential that is open to us. This is our best self, the egoless self, that bit of the universe acting through us for the good of all. And I know some people might have an issue with her quoting Deepak Chopra. Not a huge fan of Deepak Chopra. I do understand that he allegedly is tied up with some nefarious people. But I will also remind you guys that the darkness can't create anything. Only the light can. And so we have to look at these people's teaching too. Because there is nuggets of truth within their teachings. We can't always throw the baby out with the bath water. As my studies with Shasta continued, I was to discover that we each have the power to awaken to these archetypes within ourselves and to utilize them as allies. In this way, we can also awaken to the multi-dimensional facets of celestial beings that exist within the mind of God. We may choose to call these beings gods and goddesses or to think of them as facets of our, of our being that we can be called up in times of need. But no matter how we look at them, they represent templates that are found in all. And when we can learn to interact with them, we can experience their wisdom for ourselves. Deepak Chopra writes, Every one of us is hardwired at the level of the soul to enact or model certain archetypal characteristics. They are seeds sown within us. When a seed sprouts, it releases the pattering force that allows it to grow into a certain type of plant. The activation of an archetype releases its patterning forces that allows us to become more of what we already are destined to be. Adopting an archetype is not labeling. 
because it is not about limitations. Quite the opposite. Archetypes are life models, images, and ideas that guide the direction of your life towards your soul's ultimate destiny. Recognizing your true nature and allowing it to blossom is part of the beauty of living from the level of the soul. You can become the hero or the heroine of the mythical saga. The blueprint that the universe intends for you is found at the level of the soul. We get clues in the form of coincidences, and we get guidance in the form of archetypes. And I want to remind you guys, I know a lot of people who have been programmed into the cult of Christianity might have issues with this, but I think if I explain it this way, maybe you will understand what they mean by these stories being archetypes of your own self. As many of you know, on this channel, I often talk about the Ramayana, which is a a uh, Hindu story in the mythology of the Hindu religion. It's the story of Ram and Hanuman. Hanuman is the monkey god. Ram is the incarnation of God. In the story of the Ramayana, Ram marries his wife Sita. Sita gets um, cap held captive by this demon called Ravana. Ravana is the ten-headed demon who cannot be slain. You cut one head off and another one just grows right back. And Ravana takes Sita to Sri Lanka, which is the island right off of, of India. And Ram's desperate to find his wife, Sita. He's heartbroken. His, he can't find his partner. And so he hires Hanuman, the warrior god. Hanuman is associated with the planet Mars, which is the warring planet also associated with the day Tuesday, which is the day of Hanuman or, or Mars, the warring planet. And Hanuman, throughout this period, he, he kind of forgets who he is. He forgets that his father is, is the lord of breath and wind. And he forgets that he has these special powers. But when he remembers he has special powers, he uses them. For example, he figures out that Ravana has taken Sita to Sri Lanka. And so he uses his powers to jump from the shores of India all the way to the island of Sri Lanka. And he finds Sita held captive in the forest. Now, Hanuman has a choice to make. He could very easily just take Sita and bring her back to Ram. But without defeating Ravana, the cycle would continue. Ravana would come and once again kidnap Sita and bring her back to Sri Lanka. So, Hanuman knows that he must confront Ravana. He must battle against this demon that can't be slain. And I won't go into detail about what happens. I suggest everyone read the Ramayana for yourself. But he does end up defeating Ravana. And he returns Sita back to Ram. Well, you could see this as a literal story. But you can also see this story as an archetype or as a metaphor. Ram is God. Sita is your soul. Ravana, the ten-headed demon who cannot be slain, is your ego. Hanuman? Hanuman's your courage. Anybody who takes a spiritual path and really does the work has to show great courage to battle against one's own ego, the false sense of self the demon who can't be slain, to return one's soul back to God. That's the story of the archetype. It's very powerful. It's all the story of the Ramayana. That's all elements of you. All of it is elements of you. All right, let's continue. So how do we define an archetype? Archetypes are primordial ideas that structure reality. They appear to us in the form of symbolic images and may appear in the form of a variety of symbols. They are the vocabulary of the psyche itself through which the initiates can communicate with their own inner depths. Ar archetypes can also be defined as pre-conscious psychic dispositions that enable a person to act in a particular manner. Depending on the orientation of a particular society, these architects may be viewed in a variety of ways. Religion considers them as divinities. History calls them myths or legends, and psychology labels them complex or archetype. As a clairvoyant, however, I was discovered that they are far more than simply psychological constructs. 
Plato, and Jung on celestial archetypes. Today, most people are familiar with the term archetype through the work of pioneering psychologist Carl Jung, founder of the Jungian psychology. However, Jung's work springs from an even earlier epistemology taught by the famous Greek philosopher Plato, who placed the existence of archetypes at the center of his worldview nearly 2,500 years ago. Where modern-day civilization primarily looks to external worlds for answers, earlier cultures often probed behind the worlds of form to the spiritual realms they believed create the visible worlds. They studied the patterns of nature and connected these observations to science, philosophy, and religion to forge a more integrated worldview. And you guys know I love I love me some Plato. Also, Carl Jung, my first ever deck of tarot cards were the Jungian tarot cards, and they are some of the hardest tarot cards to read. I like a challenge, obviously. Um, and they're hard because sometimes they don't look like the traditional tarot cards in their in their pictures. And this is done intentionally because Carl Jung wanted you to tap into your psyche to your intuition like and that's what divination is for right divination is not for gossip it's not for spying on people divination is for you to be able to type to, to, to tap deeper into your own psyche that's what tarot cards are for they're for you to learn yourself to know yourself to know the deep inner thoughts of your own psyche right and so that's why carl young's uh the Jungian tarot deck is so powerful is because it really doesn't give you much as far as the illustration because it wants for you it wants you it's probing you to look within yourself and i will link these tarot cards down in the description box below if that's something that you are interested in and i will remind you guys that the uh early faith i, mean, I don't even want to say church because church is a bad is not good but the early followers of yeshua and magdalene heavily the Essenes heavily studied Plato's work Plato was a part of the early Christian theology Plato, Plato came to believe that these overreaching patterns stem from the existence of even larger cosmic beings that he called archetypes forms or ideals meaning meaning patterns of potential that live within us all Plato believed that these forms are actually the eternal expression of divinity itself the mind stuff of God Thus, they have the power to influence the world around us. The ancients believe that these energies, which they called gods and goddesses, are broadcast through the emanations of the planets, the subtle energies that bathe our planet and other planets as well. The ancients ascribed various qualities to each of these planets, linking them to the gods, Venus, Mars, and Saturn, for example, who I just talked about in the Hindu um faith uh, hanuman is associated with mars and tuesday the the planet of war and and war can be used for good and for bad it's not just a negative thing uh, for example mr t president t has a lot of mars in his chart there's a lot of the hanuman element in his birth chart so the ancients describe various qualities to each of these planets linking into the gods venus mars and saturn for example came to represent the energies of love beauty courage and action and structure and discipline respectively this range of qualities can also be found within each of us at various times exactly so mars even though it's the planet of war war it's also the planet of courage hanuman had that courage that's what i was saying hanuman represents the courage within you to face yourself does that make sense? Does that make sense with the archetypes? I don't want this language to make, if you've been programmed or if you're coming out of programming from cult indoctrination from the church, I don't want you to see this as something it's not because it's very powerful. The Playing with the idea of archetypes is extremely powerful when it comes to, to knowing yourself and your own journey as a human being on this planet. The Greeks also observed these same great archetypes in their tales of gods and goddesses of ancient legends. These are larger than life prototypes that appear in every culture of the world. Some of these gods were helpful to human beings while other place obstacles in our way. The appearance of such a being might signal the onset of a challenge, the awakening of love or the overwhelming power to transform one's life. Yet the ancients recognized the traits of these gods and goddesses, whether based on extraterrestrial visitors or not, also existed within human beings as divine potentials, which means that they can be activated in our lives at any time. 
Oh, obstacles. Ganesh, who is probably the most famous of all the Hindu deities, is the remover of obstacles, as people like to say, but he's also the bringer of obstacles, of necessary obstacles. Modern psychology has assigned them to various labels. The lover, the warrior, the hermit, the sage, the prostitute, the beggar, the thief, the minstrel, the artist, the visionary, the prophet, the queen, the king, the critic, the perfectionist, and the scholar, just to name a few. Plato believed, like Young, Many, year, many centuries later, that the direct knowledge of these intelligences is the only knowledge there is, for they are the real spiritual intelligence that lie behind the world of the scene, generating the framework upon which all life is created. Joseph Campbell, the re renowned mythologist, tells us, the symbols of mythology are not manufactured. They cannot be ordered, invented, or permanently suppressed. They are spontaneous productions of the psyche, and each bears within it undamaged the germ power of its own source. Much of the knowledge taught within the ancient mystery traditions was transmitted through the use of the archetypes and myths, stories, and symbols. To the ancients, knowledge of the gods was a shorthand way of conveying a host of enduring truths that speak to the deepest level of our being. Throughout the inhabited world, in all times and under every circumstance, the myths of man have flourished, and they have been the living inspiration of whatever else may have appeared out of the activities of the human body and mind. It would not be too much to say that myth is the secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into human cultural manifestation. Understanding this can be quite a stretch for those raised in materialistic society and taught to cling only to external realities exactly like most religions teach you to cling to external realities not your own internal knowledge even though yashua literally said the kingdom of heaven is inside of you and understanding how these forces work it is helpful to consider the ancient axiom as above so below meaning that physical energies at play in the world around us are often a reflection of a larger spiritual reality exactly are as we say on this channel a lot as the macro, so the micro. Heal the micro, then you heal the macro. You can't heal the macro without healing the micro. It doesn't work. It only works when you heal the micro first because the micro is a reflection of the macro. It's a mirror. Everything outside of you is a direct mirror of yourself. While today most of us are unaware that such a realm of invisible supernatural beings even exists, when we begin to work with divinities, we awaken our ability to interact with these teachers. Macrobius, the famous philosopher of the 5th century CE, writes, The mysteries are concealed in myths, so that the few may know the real secret through interpreting them wisely, while the rest are able to happily venerate the mystery defended by these allegories against banality. Plato maintained that human beings can experience contact with these gods and goddesses directly before we incarnate into this world. This happens between lifetimes in the heavenly worlds. He explained this concept in the Phaedrus, arguing that after death, each soul passes through the higher realms during the stage of metapsychoses. At this time, the soul has the opportunity to gain an awareness of the divinities, and then through our interactions with these divine beings, we may be inspired to express certain aspects of their essence ourselves. Pythagoras also taught Meta metapsychoses the belief that when a soul passes through the higher heavens they sometimes interact with these divine presences plato called what we bring back to earth recollection recollection is the recall of visions from a time in the heavenly worlds that predates this life some people he writes actually remember these higher beings and thus find themselves dedicated to a life of justice or heroism art Music, truth, or beauty, the love of children, or the passion of dance. This is precisely because we have been inspired by these divinities before we were born. 33rd degree, Mason Manley P. Hall writes, and remember guys, 33rd degree means that you've literally gotten into the satanic stuff, but again, darkness cannot create anything. It can only steal from the light, so we don't need to throw out all their teachings because we need to see what they know because they know things we don't know that was created by the light that they stole okay so i just want to make that clear whenever whenever through self un unfoldment an individual attains to the state of, un of conscious symbolism by a certain god then that god is declared to be an incarnate in that personality and to actually walk the earth 
Pythagoras believed, like teachers in the mystery schools, that all souls reincarnate in their own evolving quest for perfection. Whatever is not learned in one lifetime is repeated in the next until we finally awaken to the inner light and begin to connect with our true nature. The idea that we are each connected to a larger divinity is a powerful one. My own spirit guides, Rigel and Ariel, had long ago told me that we are each like wicks in a candle connected in the great chain of being the highest heavens down to earth. By following the thread upward, we can discover large pieces of ourselves. So whether we think of them as gods or goddesses, teachers, angels, spirit guides, or as higher aspects of our own divine self, these divinities can become powerful spirit allies to assist us in our mission here on earth. In Republic, Plato writes, When all the souls have chosen their lives according to their lots, they went before Lachis, god of faith, god, goddess of faith, and she sent with each, as the guardian of his life and the ful fulfiller of his choice, the genius, demon, or guardian spirit that he had chosen. And this divinity led the soul first to Clo Clotho. Clotho spins the destiny of our lives with the red threads of fate. Under her hand and her turning of the spindle, the destinies of the chosen lot is ratified. Then the genius again leads the soul of the spinning of the atropus, a term meaning fixed or determined, to make the web of its destiny irre irreversible, and then without a backward look, it passed beneath the throne of necessity. This tells us that before each lifetime, we decide on our purpose. Then we come before the goddess of fate to choose the spirit guide we will, that will best assist us in our mission. This guide then leads us before the divinities who will help to map out the details of that lifetime, including the decision to be born into a rich or poor family, our sex and race, the country of our birth, and the sole contract we have agreed to take on in a particular incarnation. This also includes the physical, mental, and emotional endowments that we will need to fulfill our purpose once we have grown up. So why do we not remember these decisions? The Greek belief is that we pass through the leaf, the river of forgetfulness, on our way to earth, and forget the agreements that we have made. Yet, we are still overseen by our spirit guides who nudge, support, and encourage us from behind the scenes, helping us to align with our higher purpose. Once we do, through the use of our own free Free will, the divinities are there to help us fulfill our contracts. And free will is huge, you guys. And I, I, I was actually talking to Stephanie about this today. We, ha I really feel like we have to stop using the word prophecy because the word prophecy is a very a uh, trickster word, right? We hear prophecy, we think, oh, it's all taken care of. We're all good. We don't need to do anything. It's probability. That's what the Cassiopeians use. That's what a lot of these higher beings use. They never use the word prophecy. They always use the word probability. There's a probability that this will be the outcome, but it's not guaranteed. When people hear prophecy, I think sometimes they think it's all guaranteed and therefore they don't have to do anything. And then that pushes us out of the prophecy, right? It's all just probability because of free will. You can make a soul contract to do something, but because when you come to earth, you have free will, you can opt to not do it. Right? That's why everything becomes probability and not set in stone. While the topic of angels or spirit guides is generally left to theology, some psychologists, historians, and mystics like myself would argue that these overlighting divinities exist far beyond the mortal world and are much larger in the scope than our minds can conceive. Historian Richard Tarnas writes, Platonic forms poses a quality of being a degree of reality that is superior to that of the concrete world. Platonic archetypes not only form the world, but also stand beyond it. They manifest themselves within time, and yet they are timeless. They constitute the veiled essence of things. They are the intelligence behind the mundane, visible world that lies all around us. Carl Jung comes on the scene. The famous psychologist Carl Jung once wrote, Archetypes have their origins in the dawn of human history. The psyche is not of today. Its ancestry goes back many millions of years. Jung readily admitted that he had first discovered the concept of archetypes in the teachings of the Hellenistic and Gnostic worlds, where spiritual initiates were introduced to the myths, heroes, and archetypes that offered a gateway to understanding the higher realms. Young's understanding of these spiritual intelligence gives us tools that allow us to reconcile 
the cold objectivism of modern day science with the inner yearnings of spiritual faith that bind the universe together. Born in Germany in 1875, Young was the son of a Protestant minister. His grandfather was an Old Testament scholar who spoke with spiritualists, and his grandmother was known to fall into trances and prophecy. Growing up, Young read wildly, divulging into the literature of spiritualism and psychic research, including Protestant theology, Christian mysticism, and the mystical works of Emanuel Swedenborg. He absorbed the traditions of the German Romantics and studied biology in the works of Charles Darwin and Ernst Haeckel, seeking to reconcile the world of science with the worlds of philosophy, faith, and mysticism. From 1900 to 1909, Young worked as a psychiatrist in a mental hospital and began lecturing at the University of Zurich in 1905. He was active in the Freudian psychoanalytic movement from 1907 to 1913 and from there went on to develop the foundations for what we know today as Jungian psychology and an approach that grew out of his years of private practice from 1913 to 1936. In his early years he tried to link these recurring archetypes which appear in every ancient religion of the world to both genetics and heredity but over time he, could be, he became convinced these archetypes are real active forces in the world of nature. Over the course of his many studies in history, religion, and mythology, psychology, and parapsychology, Jung discovered that the same archetypal patterns seem to exist in every period of history, no matter what culture he probed. Jung ultimately came to believe that, like the creational gods of ancient Egypt, called the Nereru, these gods or archetypes are the elemental force that has played a vital role in the creation of the human psyche. The true power of working with such divinities, Young believed, lies in their ability to both inform us and transform us. The nature of archetypes. And I, I apologize again, there will probably be doing work outside of my place for like two years because they're building a high rise. Hopefully I won't be in this location much longer, fingers crossed. Um, I will be relocating to a different state. Uh, but please forgive me for all the outside noise you might hear. It's not, There's nothing I can do about it. So, One of Young's many contributions was to develop a therapeutic technique based on the spiritual practice of the early Gnostics who were devoted to the reawakening of the divine self behind the many facets of personality. And the Gnostics were the original Christians, right? In this process, initiates enter into an objective relationship with the various archetypes of sub-personalities found within their inner world. Then they interact with these archetypes through a process of inner dialogue. In this way, we each discover whether these voices are merely a sub-personality or voice within ourselves programmed by our upbringing, or whether there is a genuine spirit guide speaking from inside of us. Jung wrote of his own personal experience with just such a guide named Philemon, who became his spiritual instructor just as Rigel and Oriel had become mine. Philemon and other figures of my, of my fantasies brought home to me the crucial insight that there were things in my psyche which I do not produce, but which produces themselves and has their own life. These benevolent powers then have the abilities to act as allies or teachers for us in our journeys. Archetypes can be considered from both a psychological and spiritual point of view. Certainly, we can argue that anything that appears in our dreams is simply an aspect of ourselves. However, there are times when we may make contact with beings from a higher plane who exist independent of ourselves, whether we call them masters, sages, angels, or divinities. You guys know, if you've been on this channel for a while, that Magdalene is one of my guides. I've seen her and heard her since I was 16 years old. And many of you guys who can see in here also say you see her standing behind me a lot. This whole series was basically her idea. So, um, so that is true, that we have these higher guides that guide us. She's been one of mine my whole entire life. These beings have their own history, and they have lived and breathed quite separately from us. Christian theology might define them as Mother Mary or the Savior Jesus or Yahshua. Egyptians might see them as visions of Horus or from Isis. In Native American wisdom, such might encounter the white buffalo calf woman or in Chinese culture, Quan Yen. 
All these events are possible for each of these divine presence has acted as an overseeing spirit guide for entire cultures. When the person experiencing these encounters has no prior knowledge of these beings, something that has happened to me time and time again, the messages that divinity conveys can then be tested or corroborated by those who have similar encounters throughout history. Reconciling these kinds of profound encounters with modern day paradigms is a major challenge before us for the modern mind seeks to compartmentalize our life experiences into the mental constructs we have been taught compose reality while these encounters with beings from another plane of existence may not only be real but also life-changing most of us are at a loss to explain how such events could happen that is because current western theology does not provide a template for the multi-dimensional nature of reality or for understanding how these various aspects of the divine can act as teachers for our growth. And once again, if you hear a vibrating sound that is coming from next door. During the course of our spiritual unfoldment, many of us may connect with several sets of spirit guides at different points along our journeys, just as we are assigned different teachers in schools appropriate to our current level of learning. When a new teacher arrives, we may be completely stunned at the depth of our own reaction. In response to these developments, Young has moved to remark that there is a god or goddess at the heart of every complex. Young claimed that his fir he first discovered the power of archetypes by observing the radical changes in his client's behavior that were often accomplished by having their lives turned completely upside down. We find ourselves madly in love, brooding over an issue, and sud suddenly compelled to have children insanely possessive ready to settle down are acting with the passion of a zealot these emotions often have archetypal corollaries deities who have played out these emotions on a grand stage author robert bly points out that these archetypes are actually transformers that appear during times of life transitions this may occur in adolescence or upon meeting your future mate opening you up to an entirely new level of yourself that's powerful because um, I, I, if you've been up on this channel before, you've often heard me tell the story of how Magdalene first um, appeared to me. I was like 16, I think, probably 16 years old. And um, I went to a private school uh, here in Georgia, uh, uh, up in North, North Georgia, a school called Darlington. And we had a lake with swans on it. I freaking hate that school. Like I just... God, the amount of abuse that happened in the school is unbelievable. But that's a story for a, a different day. I would often say as a kid, like my parents were literally paying thousands and thousands of dollars a year to have me abused. Um, I would say that to them, to their face. And um, there have been some cases now that have come out about their abuse. So again, story for a different day. But anyway, I, I remember walking. Um, I was walking towards the building that housed the language department and the math department. And I remember I had my backpack on and the lake was to my left, the, the swans, the swans are really fucking mean. They were so mean. And I remember walking to class and all of a sudden I heard on over my right shoulder, which again, you guys always see Magdalene here. I heard her say, Mary Magdalene. And I heard it out loud. And usually I'm pretty clairvoyant. I can, I can see spirits, but I don't hear them all the time. But Magdalene, I see and I hear very clearly. And she said it again, Mary Magdalene. And then she said it again, Mary Magdalene. I kept looking back and at first I didn't see anyone there. And I was so confused as to why someone was saying that name to me because at 16, for me, that was what, 1999? Like the internet really wasn't a thing. I wasn't, you know, church. I, I knew who Magdalene was through church, but I thought she was like a prostitute. I had no idea the true story at this point in my life, nor did I care. I was more interested in boys. But speaking of spirituality, at that time in my life, I was about to go through or was currently going through a huge transformation. I, I was majorly spiritually attacked. I got very sick. My body temperature dropped to 92. I had these scratch marks all over me. It was wild. But again, that's a story for a different day. So the fact that she's saying these archetypes come into our lives at times of transition, that really hit me hard. It hit me hard because that's when she appeared was at that time of transition. And all these things that happened at this time for me in my life sent me on the path that brings me to this point today at almost 40 years old, talking to you guys about this on YouTube, in the society that I grew up in, 
I should not be here right now doing this as a job. The society I grew up in meant that I was going to, I come from a long line of private school kids. Um, everyone in my family is a doctor. Uh, I was supposed to like go to university to have an education, but not to use it. Right. I was going to go to university, get my education, marry my husband. And my education was supposed to be for me just to be able to carry conversation along at my husband's business meetings, right? And then have kids, have a housekeeper, all that kind of stuff. That was the life that I was supposed to live. And that's a life that a lot of my friends from high school are living to this day. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's just, that's a cultural thing. But for me, that wasn't my path. And I didn't really want it to be my path. I remember having a very specific thought about that in middle school. Like I did not want to have this life. Um, but because of what happened to me in high school, the spiritual implications of all this, yes, I did go to university. Yes, I did have my college education, but it sent me on a path of seeking, of seeking answers to spirituality, which led me to traveling the world multiple times. Um, I've lived in India now. I went to school at one of the most sought after yoga shalas in the world in my in my 30s after I had already gotten my, my first education I went back and, and I learned Sanskrit and I started to study the Vedic text and and so the fact that Magdalene and I know I'm of the Magdalene bloodline like I am one of her descendants but the fact that she appeared at that time which really you know you know what's that Robert Frost poem two two trails diverge in a forest I took the road less traveled by like I for my society where I was born and raised, I took the path, the road less traveled by, and it has made all the difference in the world. And it has made all the difference in the world. That's part of the poem. It's made all the difference in the world. My, my life is not, I've given up a lot to be able to do this, but the fact that she's saying this, so for you watching right now, maybe a good exercise is to sit down and think about times, transitory times in your life where you come to that fork in the road and you can either go one way or you can go the other way. And was there something that happened in that transitory time where you were, your momentum, your trajectory was being forced on one path but because something happened? The entrance of an archetype, you ended up diverting to the other path. And has that made all the difference in the world? Did Magdalene come to me at 16 because that was my sole contract with her? As I was coming to this earth, I know that I've known her in the past. I know who I am to her not going to say that on YouTube yet, but did I make that contract with her that she would come to me at that age to propel me down a different path, a different path than what I was supposed to be on. And of course, when you go up against your cultural norm, for many of you watching right now, you've done that. Like me, you went up against your your cultural, supposed to culturally, you went against that. That, that in itself creates friction for you to learn from the fact that I am not married the fact that I don't have children the fact that I still travel like crazy um, the fact that this is what I do for a living is 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 mysticism and and teaching this and and, and I'm the only female authorized in the freaking state of Georgia to do my particular lineage it's huge that has changed things for me you know and there is uncertainty there because I don't have a family member who can mentor me my mom never did this. My dad never did this. My sister's not doing this. I don't have aunts and uncles who did this. I am paving, pa paving my own path. And so I don't have a family member to call and be like, listen, I don't know what to do here. What do you suggest I do? Because none of them have, have had this experience. And so it's made all the difference. There's good differences and bad differences. You know, so um, I, I, I would love to be a mother. I absolutely would love to be a mother. But I haven't been able to be a mother because of the choices that this path that I've made on this path to be able to do this, to be able to go spend all this time in India, to live a life right now, the life I live is not conducive to a baby. And if I wanted to have a baby, there would be other changes that would need to be made in order to accommodate that child. And not, that's not saying it won't happen. I'm like probably 10, 15 years away from menopause. So I'm still fertile, but you know what I'm saying? Like, like it, it creates, it's not just about the destiny. It's not just about, that's one thing I think we get so wrong still. And even in the spiritual world is we think that, you know, what is my, what is my, what, what am I, why am I here? What am I supposed to do in this world? And yes, we all have a dharmatic path. We all have something we are supposed to do, but what we do, the action we do in this world really doesn't mean anything because it's about what we do inside. 
the the lessons that we learn about ourselves spiritually again as as patanjali says in the yoga sutras the whole point of this experience of us coming into the world of nature of property the dance between the shiva and the shakti the shakti being the creation of the soul the physical nature the whole point is for the soul to know itself the point is not for you to be the best pop star in the world or to be the most spiritual person in the world or to be the best mystic in the world that's not the point that might happen in your own journey but it's not the point of the journey the point of the journey is you knowing yourself the point of the journey in this timeline is not for the white hats to win the probability is that the white hats are going to win and we're going to move to fourth density positive but that's not the point the point is how you respond to that journey the point is how that journey creates friction in you so that your soul knows itself i hope that makes sense anyway just something to reflect upon. I would love to hear your stories. If you, like me, experienced a huge transition where a different archetype came in that put you on a different path that has set up that experience for you, to for your soul to know itself. All righty, here we go. Um, discovering such a divinity may occur through a dream, a vision, a near-death experience, or a spontaneous encounter. Young believes these potentials for significance are not really under our conscious control, but seem to happen as if out of nowhere. Exactly. So mine was just a spontaneous encounter. I had had some spiritual stuff happen, but when Magdalene came to me, it, it, she just came to me. I was walking to my class as a 16-year-old by the lake, and she just came, you know, um, one of the best examples I can think of is falling in love. Most of us have experienced that wild, exhilarating feeling as the chemistry overtakes us. Our beloved is Venus or Adonis in our dreams. We are possessed by an overwhelming compulsion to be with our love, elated by anything that has to do with the object of our desires. But as the weeks or months pass, the glamour seems to fall from our eyes, and instead we find ourselves projecting our hurt and anger and fear onto the other person suddenly the archetype has changed it's funny i've been thinking a lot about that about love because there's nothing more fantastic in the world than falling into romantic love it's like the best but kind of the worst feeling in the world too where you you feel like you somebody has such power over you because all you want to be is be with them and yeah it does fade you know you the honeymoon does go away but um i've studied my love language as far as how i show love and for me how i tend to show love is through acts of service and acts of like gift giving that's kind of how i show my love to people but i was thinking this this past week um i was really thinking about how do i receive love i think sometimes we often think like what do i do to show people i love them but how do i receive love and i realized that that can, that can be two different things so like i receive love through physical touch and affection that's how i receive love i'm not really into like people giving me gifts like i'm not that's not that's how i give love that's not how i receive it and i talked to my boyfriend about that like i realized that i feel and receive love by physical touch by being physically touched by my partner and by um romantic sweet nothings you know uh words of affirmation and all that kind of stuff so yeah so that's something interesting she's talking about that when we have the archetype of relationship what 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 do you know about yourself like how do you feel and receive that how do you give that back in return and when the honeymoon phase is over with your partner i think that's when the real work begins in a relationship because that's when you you have to actually like make time and really work you know because you love that person even though that's I, i'm really big about like when i'm in a relationship i'm really 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 big about certain things being boundaries and part of that is because of of the mystique of that person and the sexiness and like you know don't go to the bathroom with the door open like that's just no don't do that you know like because I, I feel like they're always need I always want to you know I, I don't with my boyfriend I, I always want to make sure my I look I'm clean my hair's done my makeup's done to show my affection and also you know to, does that make sense anyway these changes may also come during our important life passages such as sickness of a loved one or the death of a parent or mate awaking us to a deeper connection with the other side 
Why would such traumatic events usher in new archetypes? Per perhaps because the deity's perspective is exactly what we need to weather the coming storm. During the seasons of change, we often experience a departure from our safe, secure realities. And it's then that our spiritual allies can help us discover a large understanding of the world. These spirit beings and their stories give us knowledge, support, and atonement to a broader range of perceptions and have the power to change us. As Carl Jung once noted, the archetypes don't just pattern behavior, they transform it as well. In his book, Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, Jung writes that human beings share a single universal mind that is rooted in the human unconscious. In the same way that the huge tree is rooted in the ground, a concept no doubt linked to the ancient version of the tree of life. Plato would also say that these intelligent fields of energy inform the very essence of who we are at every level. Science seems to be coming to the same conclusion. Dr. Edward Whitmott, a physician turned psychotherapist, writes in The Alchemy of Healing that by applying psychic David Bohm's theories of the seen and unseen, Worlds Behind Quantum Physics, and Rupert Sheldrake's morphogenetic research field hypnosis, the ultimate nature of the universe is not substance, but in immaterial fields of dynamic forms that intercommunicate with one another through resonance. These vibration fields of intelligence can be perceived more easily when we consider them as real living beings. As members of a society that prides itself on rationalism, we would like to deny such influences. Yet, despite our best scientific theories that falling in love is only the result of chemicals released in the brain, we continue to fall in love every day. Irrationally, illogically, and undeniably, we act in ways that even the best Freudian analysis can't explain. Nothing will have you act like such a blubbering idiot than being in love. Nothing. I am the coolest person in the world until I'm around someone I'm in love with. Young's explanation of these higher dimensional realities opens up like a link between the spiritual world and the human world that neither modern day religions nor science seems, seems able to embrace despite the millions of people who have these divinely inspired encounters. The scientific view of reality. Both religion and science have long had a knee-jerk reaction when it comes to the idea of interacting with polytheistic gods. Science, which emerged out of centuries of church territorialism, deliberately limited itself to the objective study of the physical world. Yet now, physicist Miko Keku, as well as other leading-edge pioneers into subatomic research, have discovered the existence of at least 10 different dimensional levels of realities or planes, all created by a vibrational frequency of quarks, neutrons, leptons, and so forth. Many nested one inside the other. These planes are separated by a vibrational frequency, making the inhabitants of the other planes invisible. That's why you can't see spirits sometimes is because they're on another plane of existence. Doesn't mean they're not right there in front of you. You just can't see them. All of this has been prompted by the discovery of the string theory, opening up a door to areas of paranormal research that in the past were off limits to serious academics. Dr. Kiku tells us that until recently, scientists viewed the idea of multidimensional realities with suspicion. We've covered the multiverse on this channel before. I'll see if I can find some of those videos and put them in the description box below. But recently, the tide has turned dramatically with the finest minds on the planet working furiously on the subject. The reason for this sudden change in the arrival of the new theory, string theory, and its latest version, M theory, which promises not only to unravel the nature of the multiverse, but allows us to read the mind of God. Dr. Kiku reminds us that in strictly scientific terms, the N stands for membrane, but that can also mean mystery, magic, or even mother. Quantum physicist Evren Leslu, author of The Self-Actualizing Cosmos, calls the Akashic field the subtle, subtle interconnected dimensions that lie behind our visible one. This is the vast sea of the cosmos in which we swim. And it contains all the information, energies, and archetypes that are aspects of the intelligence of God. 
It's multidimensional and multi-layered. It is the world of the shaman and the mystic, and it defines and informs the invisible world. Our job is to be become more conscious of this dimensional and a powerful message of wisdom that flows through it into ours. Then we have a chance to learn from it. So while a multidimensional view of the world was once the sole a pure view of mystics we are beginning to find a basis for what the sages have long taught about the nature of reality and perhaps eventually the many beings that compose it the multi-dimensional construct is something that the masters have long imparted to initiates and it is heartening to realize that modern science is now creating an overlap between spiritual philosophical and scientific thought that is long overdue Philosopher Ken Wilbur writes, the Akashic world is a trans-universal holy field operating in a largely unmanifested dimension that gives us unity to all things manifest and is the actual ground from which the entire manifest realm emerges and to which it returns. It is ultimately responsible for the coherence of the universe itself and is well known to the mystical traditions the world over. Sociologist Kensley Dennis reminds us that this new paradigm does not destroy or collapse our current model of reality. Rather, it updates these previous stages of knowing into a more inclusive model that better serves to explain how the manifest world exists and can exist within a hidden dimensions that underlies the structure of a more complete, inclusive, energetic reality. The Fear of Gods and Goddesses in Western religion, however, the fear of interacting with other divinities comes from an entirely different root. As we have seen, within the three Abrahamic religions, the heavy-handed politics of the priest of Yahweh wiped out all the competing deities some 2,500 years ago, including the Divine Mother and her resurrected son. And remember, Yahweh means Moloch. Yahweh means Moloch. So, if you are praying to Yahweh, you are praying to Moloch. The church knows this. Oh, trust me. The church knows this. They just hope you don't figure it out. And as we have seen, the reign of terror that marks the six centuries of the Christian Inquisition is a matter of public record. Although few of us have been exposed to the details of this debauchery because it is something the church would rather keep from us. Thus, the knee-jerk reaction that most people have to the mere mention of any other gods in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam has behind it the fear of impending doom. The rabid venets of the Catholic Church, a term that means universal or all-inclusive, by the way, towards other religions has been extreme, to say the least, and the ravages of Jewish and Islamic conquest are not far behind. Pope Innocent VIII issued his edict in 1484 against the pagans. The greatest targets were those who still communed with the earth the village healers, mystics, and shamans who understood how the manifest and unmanifested realms work together to teach wisdom. Later, the same religious justified brutality was used to annihilate millions of Native Americans whose only crime was believing the spirit of God existed in everything. They embraced the concept that all life is sacred, a philosophy so threatening to the patriarchy that they began the extermination of millions, all in the name of the Prince of Peace. And if you missed that section where she goes into all of that, I will place the playlist from this book down in the description box below. And also, I want to say, as I said in another video, for the Scientologists out there saying that the Christian church doesn't do the fair gaming and the, the antics that the Scientology church does, you are wrong. They are worse than Scientology, far worse. It's just the Christian church has been doing a lot, it a lot longer than Scientology, and there are far more Christians in the world, so it gets covered up and whitewashed. But no, they are the brutality of the, the cult of Christianity, the cult of the church is far worse, far worse than what Scientology does to people. So, the gifts of working with archetypes. For those who are still challenged to expand their view of reality to include the existence of other realms, the idea of archetypes can be understood in the terms of the Jungian philosophy. In Jungian thought, when we connect with a god or a goddess, we gain the power to draw on these qualities within ourselves. One aspect of the deity might symbolize courage, while another brings wisdom. 
One archetype might awaken to a passion for music, while another inspires the pursuit of scientific understandings. In this way, we may call upon many different archetypes within our own psyche to help balance our lives. This is also the way that many ancient people worked with gods or goddesses. Exactly. It's how the Hindus work with gods and goddesses. The Hindus are not, they're not polytheistic. That's one of the biggest misunderstandings that people have about the Hindu faith. The Hindu faith is actually monotheistic, but they see all these avatars of God as different, different personality qualities of the divine that live within us as well. For example, instead of identifying with the archetype of the victim or the victimizer, the virgin or the prostitute, you might draw on the bravery of Shekmet, the lioness of healing and courage. If you are taught taking the world too seriously, you can invite the playful energies of Bast or Saraswati, the goddess of arts. In times of injustice, you can align with the principles of Mahat, Athena, or Archangel Michael, each powerful allies for justice. If you are focused on home, Hesti, goddess of the hearth, is a perfect partner. If you wish to open doors of opportunity, the Roman goddess Cardia, the Egyptian goddess Anubis, opener of the ways, or the lovely Hindu lord Ganesh are all guardians who can help you to open the door at the right time. In times of spiritual darkness, there could be no greater allies than Yahshua, Buddha, Horus, or Thoth, all masters of enlightenment. Or you might choose the powerful goddess Durga, who holds the implements of both love and power in her hand. Durga awakens enlightenment, protects the innocent, spins the universe, and repels the forces of darkness while offering the rose of divine love to all. For those who speak spiritual witnesses and wisdom and healing above all else, Sophia and Isis are profound teachers of both. If you wish to awaken the currents of compassion, wisdom, and partnership, Mother Mary and Magdalene can help connect you with the highest streams of healing benefit of these pursuits. The hero with a thousand faces. Whether you consider archetypes as just a manifestation of the collective unconscious or as real living presence, millions of people have interacted with them in life affirming ways throughout the centuries. At the very least, the stories of gods and goddesses are role models for heroism, kindness, perseverance, grace, and beauty. And in the case of Ishtar, her story provided me with a perspective to see clearly the consequences that lay before me if I repeated my mother's patterns and to make a different choice. When we step back to realize that, in all the known and unknown dimensions of space, there are trillions of life forms existing in multiple realms. It is not surprising. Many intermediary divinities between us and the source of all that is. Each one of us is created by the same intelligence. Whether we call it God or the Goddess, Atnam or the Great Mystery, this is the divine intelligence that has created our world. Since this divine presence is the sum total of all that is, divinity resides in everything and everyone. God created billions of subsets of itself, from the highest heavens to the lowest molecule. Its intrinsic patterns are repeated in the atom, the solar system, and the galaxy revealing an intelligence designed behind all things. Those beings who dwell in the higher realms are more awake than we are, while those in the worlds of shadow are often lost in amnesia and ignorance. Each life form shares this sacred spark, extending from the subatomic levels to the angelic realms, finally reaching the great ocean of love and mercy itself. Since the whole universe is alive with consciousness, Energy compartmentalizes itself into packets of more or less complexity. Those beings who are less evolved are as alive as we are, but not as aware, just as the divinities who are larger than we are are more aware. But all of these expressions of God are still smaller than the ultimate creator itself. Joseph Campbell reminds us the gods and goddesses then are to be understood as embodiments and custodians of the elixir of the imperishable being, but are not themselves the ultimate in its primary state. What the hero seeks through his intercourse with them is therefore not finally themselves, but their grace, i.e. the power of their sustaining substance. This miraculous energy substance, and this alone, is the imperishable. Now having entered the third millennium since Christ, Maybe not that much time has actually passed, though. It might be wise for us to consider an attitude of respect for all life. 
whether in this realm or the next, instead of barricading ourselves behind centuries of ignorance, superstition, and fear. After nearly half a century of studying the world's greatest myths, Joseph Campbell came to believe that all the deities of the world's great religions were only masked for the tra same transcendent truth. Truth is one. The sages speak of it by many names, he said, telling us that all spirituality is a search for the same transcendent source from which everything comes and to which everything will return. Heroes and heroines, he writes, incarnate our highest values, and it is by following that stream of divinity that we arrive at the great river that allows us to claim the totality of who we really are.